This weekend, I flew over to Melbourne to meet Sabri Subi. He owns one of Australia's biggest marketing agencies. He challenged me to ping pong, watch to the end to see who wins. <laughs> Today we are in Melbourne, which is exciting. We're going to Sabri's office and we're gonna chat with one of our Shark Tank investments, Suda. Now these guys have kind of doubled their business since Shark Tank. We might grill Sabri with some questions about how to start an agency and give you guys some tips there if he's willing to share. Sales, we've got 1.3 million. So down on yesterday, ARR and social growth is consistent with the growth yesterday, which is pretty non-existent because I'm not taking those calls. I've just been focusing on providing value. Should be a good day. Not many people know that actually Kodak was held in the same light as today's massive tech companies like Facebook. Peak revenue adjusted for inflation was probably like $50 billion. The scary thing is that they actually created the digital camera first, but because their existing business was so good where people actually bought the cameras from them, then they needed to go and actually get the film developed. So it was like a subscription model. They pretty much buried that technology. It's called the innovator's dilemma. People are too scared to disrupt their existing business model, which allows incumbents to come in. It happened to a blockbuster as well. King Pong. Hello? Anybody home? Howdy, how's it going? Hey mate! How are you doing? This is a nice office. Thank you. For the big dog? Well, I, I did it this way. So I didn't have to set up a, um, a video studio. It was a bunch of like small little offices and we just gutted the whole thing out and Inside is amazing. Yeah. Like outside looks like decrepit. Out of, yeah, to, outside yeah. it's like it looks like from the Ferrari. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it looks it look, it's, it's good. It's unsuspecting. Yeah, it's so cool. I'll take you for a spin. Later. Why'd you Why'd you get this? this? Was this always on the wish list? Just Yolo. It's so cool, man. Yeah. Is it the black one down there? It is. If one of your team doesn't have one. <laughs> good. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard not to tell with it. Yeah, with the plates. made such a good call with the black. Uh, yeah, like yeah. the red is kind of. Bit out there, a bit it in looks, your face. Yeah. How have you been? Good. Yeah, just got back from yeah. LA on Saturday. Is that with your team over there? Yeah, I took a few of my team over there and then we've obviously got, was this about 14 of them over there now? Yeah. So just is that going help, over. Is that helping with the global expansion side of things? So. Yeah, it's got to be. It's kind of like it was forced. We were getting clients over there. Mm -hmm. And then in the beginning it was okay and then it just gets to a point where they want to have speak to people in their own time zone. Yeah. So what is it? It's 10 now and then we'll go, we'll spend whatever, an hour and a half with the guys. Mm -hmm. However long we last, we last. And then I've got reservations for us for lunch, just awesome. walking distance from here. So then we'll come back here after lunch and do like a sit down yeah, for cool. an hour or so. And then I'll take you for a spin. Sweet. That's the real car. Oh my God, what is that? Oh, it's electric as well. It's so cool. I'll show you this. Can you drive it around? Yeah. Also? You'll love it. I deliver drinks on Fridays. That's so fun. It's fucking hilarious. It's a definitely workplace safety though. <laughs> you can see we're not really fussed around that, around these parts. This is faster than the Ferrari. It's like real life Mario. <laughs> Not distract, not distracting at all. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> Watch out. You've got to get more than one so you can race. I know, right? All right, we're in here. Are you good at table tennis, Sabri? You look like a fucking good at table tennis kind of person. Yeah, I'm small and I'm nimble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What'd you get me? You always get gifts. You got me peanut butter. Sabri socks. How did you know? <laughs> you read the card. How did you? Know? What's the card? Oh, I never eat cards. I knew the last couple of months would be rough. I mean, you must have a severe separation anxiety since wrapping up filming. I actually did. I missed you. You better rock them. I'll rock them with the sandals. <laughs> your feet will probably sweat like crazy. Oh man, they're already sweating. My life is complete. <laughs> Yes, the answer is yes. What is something that you're, you're working on right now that you're excited about? At the moment, really focusing on YouTube and mentoring. So I did like 50 mentoring calls last year, just more so for interest. 
and it was amazing how every single person had the exact same questions that I had like when I was growing. I really do feel kind of a calling to help these brands, YouTube as well. I just enjoy you know, having, a, having an ADHD brain, always just wanting to do new things and exciting things. Like YouTube is just like the best opportunity for that because you can just constantly do something creative every single week. Um, my editor sometimes hates that, but uh, at the same time, it, it, no, nah, it's exciting to me. You're saying that there's people who keep on falling through those common mistakes. Mm -hmm. What would you say is like, for you personally, is the hardest lesson that you've had to learn in business? Don't trust the wrong people. If you trust the wrong people, we as young entrepreneurs get put in boxes. And the box and the story we are told is that we are incapable and we need to surround ourselves with good people. And that is true. But the problem is we don't know what a good person is. And that leads us to be susceptible because people are pushing this narrative to us to really be reactive and hire the wrong people and then put way too much faith in them and then they, their incentives don't align and they run the business into the ground. And I see it very, very common, like people are like, they don't believe in themselves enough and they hire a gray haired executive and they go, here's all of my operations or here's all my finance because I just want to go do marketing and do the fun stuff. And then in 12 months they go, oh, what happened to these forecasts? And it's like, oh no, we're out of money. We weren't paying tax in this region. And it's like, okay, that is your responsibility. That is your fault. But because you are trusting in this person and this narrative, that's where you've kind of fell short. What's the hardest thing that you've ever had to do in your life and why? Definitely the most, the hardest thing that I've ever had to do happened last year when I came back from Everest after doing the hike, I had, uh, for the first time ever, had uh, like two weeks off, like first time for five years after launching Udi. And I've always like had a little bit of like social anxiety, like it's been there. But as soon as I came back, I did like 14 hour day, I was taking like daffodils and stuff like that. I was just working nonstop. I'd just been sued multiple times. I almost lost the business, as I said. And every day at 3 p.m. I would have a panic attack. So I was like wrapped around the toilet at one point, just wondering if my brain would ever come back. It was almost like a psychosis. And building back up from that was the hardest thing ever. I went to the doctor and I was like, look, like something's going on with my chest, like I can't breathe. And I was like, it's just physical, just sort it out. He's like, no, it's anxiety. I was like, no, 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 it's, it's not anxiety. And he's like, I can guarantee you it is. Went to another doctor, he's like, this is anxiety. And I was like, no, 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 no. But anyway, he put me on SSRIs and I was like, this isn't helping, it's all still shit. I was like, so what, what do we do as problem solvers when something like that goes wrong? We write a list and we approach with intensity. We like hit it hard, which yeah. is like the polar opposite thing that you do. Like you can't, you can't work your way out of a problem that work has created. Yeah. It got to a point where I didn't want any money. I didn't, I almost didn't want to be alive. And getting out of that and still being myself and still loving business was like, I just like, I'm so thankful that that happened because now I love life and I'm yeah. happy. Just, and I still have, this will never be a battle that goes away because I, I just know it's there. Um, but like I manage it now and I know when to take a break and I'm probably more efficient from it as well. I still work 12 hour days, like I'm not, but I don't push myself to doing all nighters and then you know doing five of these interviews because I know that that's gonna do it. So yeah. I, I, I met my limit, which was interesting. Thanks for sharing that, it's an incredible story. This looks so nice. When did you get it? I got it about a month and a half ago. What, what is it, like what model? It's a 488. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I don't yeah. know a lot about How cars long did you either. Have to, don't you have to wait ages for them? I was lucky. So I was looking at this one at a different model, but I, the other ones you have to wait like 18 months to get it. And yeah. I was like, I'm not going to wait. I'm not no. going to wait 18 months. I'm like impulsive. It's like, so it was they there, want it. It was there yeah, and you just there. bought it. Yeah, I'm like, this is the one I want. How much was it? Let's roll, 500K. Fuck yeah, let's get yeah. into it. How do you go with being low to the ground? That was my only issue with it. When I was younger, the dream was to have a a, conver a red convertible. Yeah, just but any red convertible? Yeah, any like, red convertible. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. So tell me, 
Is an agency really that simple? I think an agency business is one of the hardest businesses to scale. I think it's really easy. It's like anything. When there's low capital to get set up, it just, there's no moat around the business, right? So a lot of people start it up, they watch a few tutorials, and what happens to a lot of people that start agencies is they run it, they get a couple of clients, five, 10 clients, and then they start to get very, very stressed out. And even for me, when I was like starting my business, like not until I got like 13 employees, was it not the most stressful thing in the world to run. And because also like not only do you have like the operational complexities of like scaling up, getting more humans in order to deliver the service because I'm in the people business, right? And, and my product is the people that I employ, the training that I provide, the experience that we give our clients. And that's a really hard thing to scale is scaling humans. Yeah. And then in addition to that, you know, the, the, the number one shortage other than developers and engineers is like people in the performance marketing niche because every single business is in the digital marketing business now, right? So you're in constant competition to get the best talent, but in order to provide like a good experience for your clients, you have to have good talent. So like, I think that there's obviously a lot of people on YouTube specifically that are saying like the agency business is the best business model to start. And I think that it's an incredible place to start for a lot of people because you learn like all the fundamental skills that you need to scale a business. Like you learn about running ads, mm. you learn about sales and you learn about fulfillment and building teams, yeah. right? But then there's this huge kind of graveyard of people that run businesses that are ne never able to get it beyond that. I think that it's either a great lifestyle business where you run it with like you and a few small team members and you're, you know, doing a million or so in revenue. And then there's, you have to cross the, the chasm. And right? you're still working ridiculous hours. Ridiculous well. hours, yeah. Brutal. And it's all dependent on you. Like you can't have a holiday as well. Yeah, in the beginning you definitely can't. Mm. And then if you're able to cross the chasm and you're able to like bring in leaders into your organization, hire an operations manager and build out a team. So what is that first, let's say you're running a Facebook agency or just a full service agency. So you've got your Facebook media buyer, you've got your email marketer, you're, you're, you're closing the leads. What is the next hire? Like, is it an operations manager so that you, you can step out of the business? Yeah, I think that in the beginning, it's like what most people get stuck in is that they, they start off as the practitioner yeah. and they start off by being the person that's running the Facebook ads for the clients. Mm. And then they get a few clients like through word of mouth and then inevitably clients churn in and churn out mm. of the business. And then from that point is you need to really build really good systems and processes so you can still deliver the, a good service and a good result for your clients. And then you need to be spending the bulk of your time bringing on new clients because that's where the cash comes from till you eventually get to a point where you can hire people to do the sales mm. and also do the fulfillment. And you can be like the architect that looks over the whole business and being like, you know, you're always doing R&D, you're running R&D on your own ad accounts, you're looking at trends across all of your clients, and then you're getting those trends and you're taking the learnings from one client to another one, because that's the biggest, like, hack and value proposition for a lot of agencies, is that, like, you've already got, like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in media spend and you can apply those learnings to other clients. And most people never leverage those networks effects because they're so busy getting stuck, stuck in bogged down in the day to day of the business. And in terms of like your journey, like you, you would have the biggest agency in Australia, wouldn't you? I think one of them, yeah. Yeah. And globally, like, do you, are you public about figures? A bit. Yes. Yeah. What, how much do you turn over? Yeah. So we're, we'll do north of 40 million this year. Yeah. Yeah. So agencies like it's, it's typically hard to get to crazy high numbers unless you look at traditional agencies. Um, but one of the things that are naturally attractive is the profitability. Yeah, and of course. Like compared to e-commerce, we're running at, you know, 10 to 
profitability, but then even cash flow is like what five percent sometimes. Yeah. So what what are the margins and stuff like that with agencies? Typically? Yeah, it, it depends. If you're like just a complete niche operator and you you operate in just one service vertical, they, they can go up as high as fifty yeah. percent. Yeah, that's crazy. Absolutely crazy. And your journey. So, what, how when did you start it? And like walk us through like what are the key kind of things that just exploded it? Like the the main decisions that you made that brought you here versus say that person that gave up after like a million because they couldn't hire anyone. Yeah, I think that like for me, I was, you know, I started, I had failed lots of businesses. I'd run e-commerce businesses. I had run group buying businesses. I had raised venture capital before. I did a joint venture with three of the biggest AFL football um, clubs in, in the country. Um, I had sold a business. I had done a whole bunch of stuff, but I basically found myself back at square one in the business and I didn't have any, well in life, not even in the business, and I didn't have any money. And i just gotten married to my wife and I was like, what the fuck am I gonna do? Like I'm <laughs> fucking around with all these different businesses and nothing is like, I was like kind of just jumping around from shiny object syndrome to different other businesses and was like, hey, like something's got to change. I've got to knuckle down and do something. And all of the businesses that I ever ran, I was always the customer acquisition expert. And I was like, hey, I see a big opportunity in just solving these problems for a lot of businesses. There's so many shitty agencies out there. No one's talking about ROI. No one really understands direct response. None of these digital agencies are even doing their own marketing to get clients. Um, this is a niche that I want to operate in. And I was making 150 cold calls a day. It took me three days to get my first client. It was really, really difficult. This was back in 2014. And there was already huge digital marketing spaces, um, agencies in the space. And Who was your first client? My first client was somebody that was a bit in the B2B space and they basically provided like egg cartons and cardboard boxes and packaging supplies. Yeah. Yeah. And why do you think they went with you? Did you get them good results? Or? We got them great results, right? So like, that's the thing, like I've still got some of the first few clients that I landed from my bedroom that I still count as clients today. Um, and that was off the back of one results and the relationships that I built with those people. Um, but I think that realistically, like for me, there was an inflection point where I, I, you know, I had 70 clients. I was doing all of the fulfillment. Mm. I was selling, I was account managing one week a month. Um, I brought my wife into the business and it was like, I had this kind of conversation with myself, like, are you going to like, keep on doing this like healthy cash flow business or are you going to build something that's a lot bigger than yourself and I'd lost a I had a prospective client on the line and they wanted to sign up for like a you know a 40 grand website or something like that at the time and that was like huge life-changing money for me and they wanted to come into my office and I didn't have an office at that stage and then I was like okay I need to build something that's a lot bigger than myself got my first office and then the first hire that I did was sales to buy back some of my time because I was spending the bulk of, I was like selling by day and doing all the client work by night. And I bought back some time there and then the second hire was a developer. But that salesperson and that developer is still with me today. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and then, you know, I hired another salesperson and then someone to run Facebook ads. And the, the challenges in that stage is that like the moment that someone leaves you, like that you're back in the ads manager yeah, the building. Whole, ads. the whole thing comes crumbling down. Yeah, and it's like you can't afford a backup person. No, yeah. and that was like that's the that's the the, the chasm that I'm talking about crossing. And it, like for me, it was not. I had to have two people in every division for me to then break free and get some freedom in the business. Where if somebody left, I wasn't back in doing that one thing again, and there was a bit of crossover. So I, and I think that. I just kept it very, very lean and I lived so frugally and I poured everything back into the business mm. and all the attractive reasons that people say to start an agency, I looked at it through like the opposite lens of that. I didn't look at it as how I can pull money out of the business. One thing that I admire most about you is something that a lot of other people hate and that's that you're like, 
you sell and you're also very confident in yourself like like back in the day I would have hated to be in front of a camera but you are so comfortable there and you are so confident in kind of what you're selling as well what would your advice be to someone that maybe is holding their future back simply because they don't have enough conviction or they're not as charismatic in front of a camera as you because it seems like all, a lot of your opportunities including those 150 cold calls that you made in those early stages came from that confidence so what is your advice to that young person that's struggling with it yeah i think that like the most important sale that that you need to make is like yourself right and the biggest thing that like people you know don't sell themselves hard enough is themselves and it's like what we spoke about before like you touched on like people look at a lot of these people on youtube and they hold them up to some pedestal and they think that they're a lot greater than what they actually are and then that means that they think lesser of themselves because they're always putting these people up on a pedestal and when they do that it automatically cripples their own self-confidence right i think i was in a fortunate position where my mother showered with me with lots of love i, I was raised by a single parent mother and she loved me unconditionally and she always made me believe in myself and never judged me based on anything. She just, wherever my interests went, she would foster those those interests, right? So I think a lot of it is definitely environmental in the way that I grew up. But then in terms of how do you build the confidence, first of all, you need to build the skill and then you need to let the confidence flow from that skill. Like for me, I was like, when I got my first sales job when I was 16, I was the worst salesperson at the whole of the company and the founder was like, hey man, like you really suck, like you're really bad, like <laughs> I'm going to have to let you go in a week unless you turn it around and then I just became obsessed. I started listening to sales calls every single day, analyzing my voice, analyzing my tonality and getting the skill that then led into the confidence and I think that even today, like it's the biggest hack that anybody can have in their business is just getting sold on like, if, if you're running a company and you're trying to bring employees into the company, getting sold about like, what an incredible place that you have created for people to come and work at, how supportive you are, how much do you invest in people's learning and development? How fair do you keep that work environment, right? And being really sold like, like this, is a, this is an incredible place to work. Like, I have worked in lots of shitty places in my life so I know when something is good and I know when something is bad and I've created something that's really good here and reminding yourself of that every day or if you're going out there and you're an agency and you're selling a product is like looking at all the other shitty agencies in your space looking at the ad accounts and how bad and how mismanaged that they are and then looking at your results and every day selling yourself on like what your value proposition is to the marketplace because like sales is just a transfer of energy whether it's in front of a camera you're on a sales call you're in front of you know a group of investors you can't transfer something that you don't have within yourself and I think that there's so much negative self-talk and I have it everyone has it there's always I call it like the little bitch that lives in your mind that is always like pulling at your heels and telling you nah you shouldn't be like that or you shouldn't be outspoken or don't go to the gym today or you've had a rough week like just don't don't work that extra hour whatever it is and it's like it's your ability to be aware of that duality in man and still combat it and still go out and get it and just have that as like a feedback loop of like you have a ritual to get yourself sold on what it is that you've got to sell the opportunity that you've got for your staff and the overall vision that you've got for your business yeah i think it's like if i was to give you like a gold bar worth ten thousand dollars and go go sell this for seven thousand dollars nobody would have a trouble trouble going to do that yeah because they believe in the value that they are providing so I think after you've quantified that, and then the second thing is just exposure therapy. Like this is like the best way to get over fear, anxiety, is by doing it. And like having a somewhat positive experience doing it as well. Yeah, and people always look at other people outside of themselves 
and they think like that everyone else is a lot greater than them, right? When it's like everything that you like, anyone that you admire, like in your life, like they have all started typically where you're starting. Exactly. And they have all just worked their way up from trial and error and learning things and applying themselves long term. And so like it's 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 not you don't want to look at just all of your mentors and where they are now and just idolize that. But you want to look at the things that those people did in the beginning and understand that their first products weren't perfect. You know, they weren't the best leaders. They didn't have the best opportunities for people to work at, but they slowly iterated and they got there and there is a natural progression that you have to go through to get there. And where you are, you might be on chapter one, you might be on chapter three, and you can't look at someone else's chapter 12 and be like, oh fuck, like they're, they're at chapter 12. Like they all started where you are. You just have to take it one step at a time and build that confidence. 100%. Oh, should we play table tennis? Yeah. Should you beat me? Yeah, let's do it. Oh shit, he's pulling his. <laughs> Shadow fist. We ain't playing around. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna be like a garden gnome next what to this that? fucking giraffe. Talk shit to each other. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> got you back. <laughs> Am I serving? Yeah, I feel like I've got the. You away. do. It's a home court advantage. Oh! <laughs> Alright, I'm warm now. If you can return one of my serves, it's, have it's, it's sudden death, you win the game. It's gonna have so much spin on it. Alright. Oh, you hit it! Does that mean I win? If you hit it, it doesn't mean you do. Alright, so 5 1. Yeah, if I lose one point, 6 1. There's a lot of spin on that. It's all looking good. Wait, what are the stakes? 10 grand? Huh? 10 grand? 10 Bragging grand then I get one server. Forever. Ferrari. Oh! <laughs> he did it! And he wins one point! Oh, oh my god. That's sudden death. You won. I don't need your sympathy six, sudden death. Six, I was still one. Beat.